When the Facts Change is brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network, in partnership with Kiwi Bank. The bank for Kiwi, looking to get ahead in business and in life. A bank that delivers expertise and banking know-how, smart advice for business owners wanting to invest, grow their business, or diversify. A bank that adapts with technology through the lens of its people and customers. It is a bank with heart that is driven by its purpose. Kiwi, making Kiwi better off. I get excited when I feel like I'm on the box seat of history, watching something happen in front of my eyes that I know will have an epic impact, not just in my place, but all around the world. A moment when maybe the world was saved. This week on When the Facts Change, we talk to an Australian technology electrification activist called Saul Griffith. And he has an extraordinary story about doing some things in the political economy of the United States that led to an absolutely mind-changing and hopefully planet-changing set of policy, some legislation called the Inflation Reduction Act, which should never have really happened. Getting anything through the US Congress is a nightmare. But getting through a whole bunch of spending on green stuff, and when I say a whole bunch, we're talking a third of a trillion dollars at least, possibly two or three times larger than that. Getting that through the Congress is like, that shouldn't happen. We talked this week on When the Facts Change on how we could think differently about the climate challenge, dealing with it, and electrifying our economy in a way that cuts our costs and flips the politics of climate change, which until now has been dominated by, oh, this is too expensive, we can't do it, it's too difficult. Flipping it on its head and doing something that we haven't seen really since the 1940s and 1950s, when the governments of the world's democracies focused on an existential threat, invested enormously and used the innovation and the skills and the techniques of everyone in that democracy to overcome an existential threat. In 1940, it was not just Hitler, but Japan's uh, dictatorship. And America responded with the Manhattan Project, with all sorts of technology and investment and different ways of doing things, which eventually led to that glorious period of economic growth and change through the 50s, 60s, and into the 70s. Now that opportunity is starting to present itself again. The existential threat is climate change. And Joe Biden and a bunch of geeks who had some hope and who could see that they could flip the political economy on climate change on its head and come up with something that could change the prospects real fast. This week on When the Facts Change, we get positive about how to deal with climate change with Saul Griffith. Kia ora and welcome to Saul Griffith, who is joining us on When the Facts Change. Great to see you, Saul. G'day, Bernard. Thanks for having me. It is uh, wonderful to have you on the show as much because your story, uh, beginning as a tech entrepreneur and now in a position to influence and um, make things happen, uh, but not just in Australia, but in the United States, is um, a cracking story. Could you tell us about you know where you started and how you ended up as a sort of an uh, electrification activist? Oh, I think my climate journey started with activism. I was a teenager when I first became aware of climate. And then I was a ratbag cyclist in the 90s and used to do things like encourage 5,000 other cyclists to join me on the Harbour Bridge to protest Australia's failure to sign up for Kyoto. So I was very concerned as a kid, but then I went off to do my PhD and then became an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley after I finished my PhD at MIT. Um, once, and then once I got into Silicon Valley, I sort of refound my love for trying to do things that matter and working on climate. And so spent close to two decades building 
energy technology companies, clean energy technology companies, and some companies in robots, uh, robotics and exoskeletons. Could you give us some examples of the sorts of machines you um, uh, built and and organized? Oh, we built a company called Makani Power that we sold to Google to, to have a shot on a big, ambitious shot on goal to make airborne wind turbines. Um, actually, a Kiwi features in that story, a lovely young man called Pete Lynn, uh, whose father still lives in New Zealand. Um, he helped us. We were designing big electric kites. A uh, solar energy company called Sunfolding, um, a heating and cooling technology company called Gradient Comfort, a couple of robotics companies, one called Rome Robotics that does exoskeletons for making humans run fast, jump higher, and then even a robotics company that does, uh, you'd call it Jip Rock in America, it's called Drywall, so robots that do all of the wax on, wax off, physical hard work of those processes. So that's a sort of selection of the companies. Um, we, did, we did a few more things in energy storage, some, some built a company in hydrogen storage that we sold. Um, so very much come from thinking about a problem structurally as an engineer, as a physicist, what is a fundamentally better machine to achieve a task and how do you build those machines and how do you build companies and technologies that, that have a big impact on things like carbon emissions. So what tempted you to come out of the, you know, relatively um, ordered and simple and uh, sensible uh, engineering world into the world of the political economy and trying to change um, policies and attitudes and things which, they're just weird. I think I thought that the engineering world was as predictable and reasonable as you think, but my experience in Silicon Valley is that on every technology we built, the regulatory barriers mm. and the regulatory barriers that advantage the incumbent technologies, mostly fossil fuels, were always a larger problem and a heavier lift than actually doing the engineering and building the technology. And so I think bruised from fighting that fight through venture raises and traditional entrepreneurial activities, um, I was fairly exhausted and Reminded my wife in 2019 that I had, she had told me that if there wasn't enough climate action by 2020, I was allowed to become an eco-terrorist. And I reminded her of that. <laughs> and she said, well, you've got two children now, so I take that back. But given that you complain about this, re these regulatory and policy problems and how much, how they're handicapping us on climate, why don't you, you know, I give you leave to go and work on that for a couple of years. And in fact, we had even rented a house in, Washington, D.C., we were going to move in with our family. The kids were going to spend the year educating themselves in the museums and the Washington Mall um, mm -hmm. while I was going to go and lobby um, both houses of co uh, Congress in the U.S. And that we were meant to move in there March 2020. Ah. And three or four days before we were going to fly out, the COVID lockdowns happened. And so... Um, my political lobbying went from uh, in person to Zooms. Um, so that was my political transition. I was fairly naive. I had a wonderful partner in the project called Alex Lasky. He's another Silicon Valley entrepreneur from the energy industry. He actually sold a lot of technology to electricity utilities. Uh, and he and I were, honestly, we, I was already writing the book Electrify, which was about data and, and um, science of the energy transition that I had done because I'd done some projects with the Department of Energy mapping energy flows. So we had all of the information and data from that book and we were frustrated with the, the Democrats' position on climate change where they would sort of say climate change this and then they would wince because <laughs> it felt like it was bad political news and it was going to cost money. And we, we started rewiring America initially to honestly help can presidential candidates uh, campaign on all the things we have to win in this global energy transition, the better health outcomes, the better economic outcomes, the better technical outcomes. Um, and so that's where we started. <laughs> the, that's where I started my <laughs> sojourn into um, climate politics. And, you know, for other um, American political tragics like me, and I'm sure many listening to the podcast, 
uh, diving into that world of American politics is um, it's difficult, and uh, there's so many competing forces and players and connections that are hard to get, and often you have to be there for an awful long time. How did you sort of uh, get in there and actually make an impact? Because you know there were a lot of people inside the Democratic Party in the United States uh, were putting forward the Green New Deal, and there was an attempt early in the Biden presidency to get that up and running. So how did you manage to, you know, um, piggyback on that and and make a difference? Some people have actually observed that um, rewiring America was born on second base. Um, mm. So Alex Lasky, my co-founder, had he lives in Washington D.C. He's very politically savvy. He's um, I sort of joke with him that he's in the I'm a very good big room communicator. So I'm you know. In one-on-one -on -one conversations with you on the street, I might stare at my shoes, but if I'm talking to a thousand faceless people, I can do that easily enough. Whereas he's one of those political operators in a small room of 20 people. He knows everyone's first name. He, know, he can remember the age of their children and which college they're going to. So we had these sort of two superpowers that combined well. I had existing relationships with um, some people who were quite powerful in the Obama administration. Um through that, you know, they had graduated into the tech sector in San Francisco, and then he had these DC connections. So we we were allowed to the table, um, and including, you know, I was asked by staff, AOC staff, to help look at writing a better Green New Deal and how would you take the Green New Deal from sort of it was political aspirations without a lot of technical backup. Uh, and uh, so they were asking me to come in and backfill and actually launched into that project. So like, but uh, AOC launched the Green New Deal <laughs> before we finished the analytical work. So ready, fire, aim. Yeah, ready, fire, aim. Um, I, I, you know, I think she's really quite an incredible politician and maybe mm -hmm. because of her impatience. But I think the Green New Deal was a little bit of a difficult start. And I think... Um, there was political pushback because it, it read more like a labor union manifesto than a climate manifesto. And I do think there's a lot of relevance to that and there's some political wisdom to that, but um, it got the it got off on the wrong foot, sadly. Mm. So that one d didn't get through Congress, obviously. And I'm always fascinated in big moments in political history where a couple of accidents, maybe the odd crisis here and there, a change in personnel and something which shouldn't normally get through somehow does. And, uh, you know, you think of the sorts of things that FDR did during the 30s or the sorts of things that LBJ did in the um, 60s. And, and then along comes an idea to sort of flip on its head the idea of a lot of investment in renewable energy and turn it into an inflation reduction story, which was of the moment completely. We've just had COVID. Everyone's talking about an inflation crisis. So tell us about you know how the Inflation Reduction Act came about. Well, I, I should say that Biden came into the White House with an extraordinary climate team. Uh, he had Ali Zaidi and Gina McCarthy, and they really had big ambitions. He hired Jennifer Granholm to be the Secretary of the Department of Energy, which is an extraordinary choice. So not choosing a technocrat and a physicist, which was the sort of the last couple of attempts from a Democrat for the Department of Energy, and choosing really an entrepreneur and a sort of energy markets person. So that signaled that they're ready to go and ready to deploy technology, not ready to debate the science. Um, so there was those were very encouraging signs. Um, but to be honest, you know, like any new administration, especially after the traumatic years of the Trump administration, who'd done a lot to undermine the mm -hmm. public sector. Now, I saw personally the Heritage Foundation ideologues that he'd hired into positions of management within the DOE. So really trying to destroy the, the institutions from within. Um, so there was a lot of work to do. Um, and honestly, the initial ideas I was always skeptical of, it was more of the same. It was like, well, let's get a carbon price implemented. Let's do um, 
clean electricity plans, which you know in and of themselves aren't bad ideas, but there's 30 years of political evidence saying that neither of those are insufficient technically and politically unpopular. And then there was the impractical or the unfortunate circumstance that they really only had 50 seats in the Senate and to get anything through the Senate, you need a supermajority of 60 seats or you need to eliminate the filibuster. The Democrats are scared of eliminating the filibuster. So then you can't really write legislation. So this is why the Inflation Reduction Act ends up being what they call all carrots. It's really just a spending bill <laughs> because you can't write legislation um, without that supermajority. So that a legislation would be, you know, we're going to phase out gas by this t- date or phase out coal. So that was off the table. So that was the structure of the um, bill was limited. Uh, and remember, before it came to the Inflation Reduction Act, for about a year, it was known as the Build Biden Build Back Better plan. Oh, that's some alliteration in search of some verbs. I always struggle with the, 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 the Biden Build Back Better plan. Um, but honestly, the initial White House ideas, we sort of encouraged them in our early meetings. Like, I really think you need to make this about the demand side. That was the conclusion of the book I'd written, Electrify. Um, uh, you, you know, if you only focus on the supply side where you get the energy from, you're you're going to be left behind in the race to decarbonize people's lives. You know, forty two percent of emissions in the US are from households and the cars they own, and another thirty percent from small businesses and the cars they own. So a supply side doesn't see that a supply side energy policy. So we lobbied hard for that, um, and in the first go round, they sort of ignored some of that advice and so we weren't getting policy but then the senate's like well this is not what you want to do isn't going to happen so come back with a better idea and so then we got invited with a few other groups okay well if we can if we have to do this sort of demand side and incentive based thing what do we do and then it was a bit of a mobilization effort there there were four or five groups who thought about this for a long time and they all got engaged and enrolled in doing the analysis and doing the models and building the argument for demand side policy. And it was extraordinary. Um, and most of these groups were philanthropically funded private groups and some universities, but everyone showed up and then started putting the effort in. And when you say demand side, what, what sort of examples are we talking about here to, you know, flip an American, you know, national obsession with um, burning gas in their large cars and turning on their boilers in their houses. How, how do you, you know, what sort of things are we talking about on the demand side? Yeah, let's step back there. So supply side is um, where you get your energy from. And it's usually measured in tons of coal, cubic feet of natural gas. Sorry if I use American units. I did a lot of this work there. Barrels of oil. And because the original American energy crisis was the oil embargo from the 70s, the, the Department of Energy sort of grew up in a supply-side crisis and has always had this sort of supply-side DNA. But, of course, if you're going to decarbonize the whole economy, you've got to think about all of the machines that use that supply-side energy, and that is the barrels of oil ultimately become gallons of gasoline or litres of petrol, and they get burned in cars. And that's a very significant portion of emissions in in America as it is in New Zealand and Australia. Um, then it's about the natural gas that winds its way up through a million, 1.3 million miles of gas pipeline in the US, delivers it to, you know, 100 million homes. You've got to, if you're going to decarbonize, the only practical way is to electrify the heating systems in all those homes. So the demand side is all of those electric heating systems. It's all of those vehicles. It's changing industrial processes from using natural gas for heat to using electricity for heat. And, you know, I think it should, the, the, economist truism that supply must equal demand is is even more true in the energy system. If you only decarbonize the supply side, you don't actually decarbonize the whole economy. You've got to do both of these things at the same time. You've got to walk and chew gum, so to speak. Um, And we were very, very big advocates for the demand side machines. And in fact, probably the political um, fluke that really had a lot of influence for us was the 
Chuck Schumer um, runs the Senate and his office was tasked with sort of the master spreadsheet and analysis for how to assemble the final bill because it's a very American bill, lots and lots of complicated pieces. And there is a couple of wonderful bureaucrats within that department who reached out to us for help with that effort because we had done this extensive modelling of the US demand side system. And so when tasked with how do you decarbonise the American economy for the get the most bang for the fewest dollars, um, that that work turned out to be critical. So that's how we sort of wound up in the in the weeds and the mechanics of of the getting the bill written. So the, on that demand side, what sort of um, machines changes are we talking about from a household small business point of view? So in the US, the demand side is quite literally about 1 billion machines. It's 280 million vehicles owned by households and small businesses. It's uh, roughly 80 million natural gas water, he water heaters, 60 million natural gas cooking machines. It's um, a few tens of millions of natural gas hot tubs and swimming pools. Uh, it's, um, you know, a hundred million water heaters. So space heaters, water heaters, cooking vehicles. Um, we even ended up counting all of the machines, including dirt bikes and golf carts. <laughs> and it actually adds up to 1 billion machines on the demand side. That's because it's fairly easy. It's 120 million households. It's about six machines for each household, two cars, water heater, space heater, kitchen. Um, and so, you know, it, it adds up very quickly. Um, and you've got to focus on how do you change out those 1 billion machines in the next 20 years if you want to hit any climate goal worth living in. And that, um, that hypothesis and thesis ended up coming to fruition in the Inflation Reduction Act. And it's why it was considered quite transformative in the history of global climate action. And I think we, we uh, had some little successes with their other people working on the bill to, to sort of prosecute this argument that it's about the machines. We've just got to dispassionately, you know, we're not going to sell to the populace um, a complete change in lifestyle. So how do you give them roughly the lifestyle they have with uh, a different set of machines? And that is the underlying theory, if you like, of the Inflation Reduction Act. Really, in the end, how did it become the Inflation Reduction Act? Um, as you, your political wonks, as you said, listen to this podcast, you'll know that there's Joe Manchin who owns coal mines. Um, in Virginia, he was a key Democrat in the Senate and he was um, reluctant for a lot of this. And part of that was about, you know, whose political victory is this? And if it's called the Build Biden Build Back Better Act, it sounds like it's Biden's political victory. If it's sort of widely known that it's Joe Manchin's Inflation Reduction Act, uh -huh. then uh, it's Joe Manchin saving you, saving his constituents from higher energy prices. And how did you how did you sell that idea to the public, or get others to sell that idea to the public that this is not about imposing extra costs; it's about finding ways to save money? Well, we sold it through the book Electrify. We did household studies in the U.S. about if you electrify the whole household, what how would that change the uh, cost of energy for an American household? You can show that. Um, fully electrification of an American household by 2030, that household will save a few thousand dollars a year. Um, that story is even better in Australia and New Zealand because our petrol and our, and our natural gas is much more expensive than it is in the US. And in Australia, our rooftop solar is much, much cheaper. So actually an average Australian household will save four or five thousand dollars a year. Um, average New Zealand household will save similarly three or four thousand dollars a year. Um, so there's this extraordinary economic carrot now on the mm. demand side and you've turned a very abstract thing climate policy into something that all of a sudden is good good for households good economic economically and that uh, i think is going to be the political success of the inflation reduction act um, because it no longer really talks about you know it's easy for a economic rationalist or a neoliberal to say well you can't afford to solve climate change think of the cost and then they'd say, well, it's going to cost trillions of dollars. But, you know, Australian households will spend $2 trillion between here and 2040 on buying cars and appliances. 
irrespective of whether they're buying electric ones or natural gas or petrol ones. For a tiny extra investment on that $2 trillion to get all electric ones, we would be saving um, tens of billions a year in Australia. So if you reframe this as an investment exercise and then the returns, actually for countries like Australia and New Zealand, we have the easiest run in the world, you because of your cheap hydroelectricity, mm. Australia because of its cheap rooftop solar, um, but probably... Uh, in the sense, you know, in the in the US, everyone's like, well, California and New York are doing better than the rest of them, but New Zealand and and ACT are doing better than California. Mm. So um, the economics of this now is such that nations need to start thinking about this investment. Um, anyway, as as to how how do we do that? So we we've published these studies and we made a lot of noise in the media about it. We we encouraged, we actually did the economics for whole census tracts for US senators saying this is how much your constituents will save mm -hmm. if you do this. So we were trying to build political economy at the level of the electorates for those candidates. And then we even wrote a presentation called Electrification is Anti-Inflationary. That's a headline. That's, that's exactly what you want. Yeah. Um, it may be circumstantial that the Inflation Reduction Act was called the Inflation Reduction Act because it was also about lowering prescription drug prices. But we, as part of our efforts, made this presentation and it shows you, and this is pretty obvious once you think about it, and you're an economist, so you love this, you know, the, if you track the cost of energy in American household from 1980 to 2020, it increased every year at roughly the rate of inflation and it gets higher and higher and higher. And that isn't surprising because fossil fuels make up a big swag of the consumer price index. And so the inflation tracks with the increase in prices in fossil fuels. The interesting thing about when you electrify something, so if I'm electrifying a house and I'm buying solar, I'm really buying 20 years of energy up front and then putting it on a financing plan. Same is true if you're building a wind farm or even a dam. And so you're locking in this fixed cost of entry for 20 years into the future with these electrification things. And so you could, we showed up with this one graph, electrification and inflationary. Here's the cost of living for an American household. It's going up and to the right. If you electrify it a day, it's going to be constant for 20 years into the future. And every year it actually will even be going down because the machines are getting cheaper. And so now all you really need is a giant macroeconomic stimulus to transform the energy market to these new better machines. And the country is in the money and then the really curious thing that I don't think this penny has dropped completely, but it has within the, the circles that the true energy wonks talk about learning curves. So there's something called the Swanson's curve, which is Moore's law for solar energy. Moore's law, you remember, computers, mm -hmm. there's a period when computers got twice as fast at half the price every 18 months. Swanson's law is the same exponential. Every time you double the amount of solar production, uh, internationally, the price is falling by about 20%. For wind, that number is about 14%. For batteries, it's about 25%. And we know that we have to double and double and double production again for all of these things. So merely by now addressing climate change through electrification, you're going to more than halve the price of all the machines that solve it. So we get to the lower cost faster by doing the project of decarbonizing faster. So there is the incentive now is to just pedal to the metal and go as fast as you can. And this is the sort of history of big, um, often government investment in technology. If you think of that period through the 40s, 50s and 60s, when during the Cold War, the US government invested enormous amounts in uh, um, obviously nuclear uh, development and uh, um, transistors and uh, electric, uh, electronic equipment computers to, you know, make sure that they could power the, the missiles and the jets and the, um, uh, and the ways to, to do war. And then, of course, those technologies were taken up by companies. You know, um, Boeing, for example, wouldn't have invented the 707 if it wasn't that they had this locked-in contract to build a, um, a, a, a tanker to refuel jets. 
And so uh, I, 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 I think that even more important aspects you're quoting, the, and America did a huge, yeah. huge investments in this through the 50s through the 70s, and it was known as America's golden age. Mm. But I actually think the critical piece of history that really I think must be understood is this all began with Roosevelt's response to the Great Depression and World War II, which was a true wartime effort against an existential crisis, namely Hitler. Mm -hmm. um, where the US government used extraordinary powers to motivate all American industry to make the critical materials to win World War II, which they did. And it was, it was you know, they went from making a few hundred planes a year in 1939 to 300,000 planes in 1944. The arsenal you know, of democracy. Yeah. Arsenal of democracy. And that was extraordinary. And it was actually riding on the momentum of that and the Marshall Plan that came afterwards, which was that 50s through 70s build out. And this is extremely analogous to the existential crisis of climate change. This demands, it's, it's uh, difficult to say this because free market ideology is still alive and well everywhere in the world. Mm. But the truth is the free market cannot hit any climate target under two degrees because the free market isn't a form isn't moving the adoption curves fast enough meaning the uptake of the all the things so you need incentives that go beyond free market and that was what the arsenal of democracy was um and it transformed the market and it really led to half a century of economic windfall for the us and global power and that's the opportunity here that in this you know response to the existential threat of climate change and um, luckily for the politics, the existential threat of inflation. And you'd have to argue the um, the Ukraine war and the way that it has shocked people into uh, perhaps moving to um, renewable energy faster has, has played a role in that. And, and what struck me about the Inflation Redu Reduction Act and the scale of it, just to impress upon listeners in New Zealand and elsewhere, a third of a trillion US dollars at least, and it's completely- Well, that's under-appreciating it. Oh, really? It's going to be bigger. So it's a spending bill, and the spending is assessed by the CBO, which is the Congressional Budget Office. So they're like a treasury. They, so they, th they make guesses at what the uptake of these tax incentives and other rebates and incentives will be, and they estimated $369 billion. If all of the incentives just for the household facing piece of the bill, which is only 35 or 40% are taken up, that alone is about 900 billion. Um, right now, the uptake of the, of the IRA looks to be about 150% of what the CBO estimated. So there's a very good chance that this spends a long way north of the 369 billion and, and really the climate action in America is now really a race to make sure that the IRA is implemented well. And it's all it comes down to, because really the federal, all the federal government can do is wave a big bag of money and, and, and say spend. The actual implementation comes down to really state governments and, and local areas. So it's now the implementation race is on. And that's the really interesting thing is once you get that money being spent, and red states and red governments and city councils and state governments start to see, hey, we could invest this money in a new factory that's going to create some new jobs, that's going to create um, cheaper electrified um, stuff that our households and voters actually love. Suddenly, people who are anti it become in favor of it, and it generates its own energy, if you like, in a political economy sense. Yeah, I just finished reading um, The Rise and Fall of the neoliberal order mm. which builds a very an argument they say the success of a political order is when the opposing team adopts your stance mm -hmm. and the case is roosevelt's stimulus of the economy through the great depression and world war ii was so popular that eisenhower couldn't do anything but agree and in fact eisenhower has sort of wrote letters to his friends saying Anyone who attacks social security or labor protections is is never going to get political uh, traction in this economy ever again. So, because the, the political order had changed and now Republicans and Democrats were agreeing. The same thing happened with Clinton, who basically was uh, 
Ronald Reagan light. Yeah. And I think I think the IRA, the hope of the IRA is to do a, a, a reorientation of the political order in in time to meet our climate demands. You, you mentioned that rise and fall of neoliberalism and New Zealand, we were right at the um, bleeding edge of, of that reform through the 80s and 90s. And there was this obsession slash, you know, fundamental belief that government couldn't pick winners, uh, public money shouldn't be used to subsidise industry, that um, the main aim of government was to get as small as possible, as far as possible, to have low taxes and the market would um, make us all rich. But this... Inflation Reduction Act, because of its size and because of what it's doing right now, it seems to be shifting perceptions about uh, how to, you know, put the chicken in front of the egg and make stuff happen faster in response to climate change. You see in the United, in the European Union, China, and elsewhere, particularly the European Union, and maybe even in Australia and New Zealand, um, governments are saying, actually, we could kickstart this with some investment. There is a financial case to back it up. There's a political case to back it up. And all of those old mantras about, you know, we don't pick winners, we don't we don't subsidize people, some of those go out the door and that electrification task and opportunity is the sort of driving force in a change in the way governments have operated or think about the world. Do, can you see some of that shift happening in the last couple of years? Yeah, so I think the electrification is anti-inflationary is one of my – I make a lot of charts. Um, <laughs> and it's one of the two favourite charts that I've made in the last couple of years. And the other one was looking at the Australian electricity market reform. So in mm. a fit of neoliberalism, we had a competition plan and a, and a privatization plan for our electricity market. And after 30 years, so from 1950 through mid-80s, electricity price in Australia fell as when it was all publicly owned. We privatized it all and, if you, and then we divided the electricity market into four different operators and the price of electricity adjusted for inflation went through the roof. So... At least on the energy and electricity market, you can the evidence is now strongly in that in fact this neoliberal privatization idea didn't work as planned. So fortunately, there's evidence that um, you know well executed, uh, publicly owned programs can be good, and I think we really need to emphasize those arguments now because we're not going to solve this without a public private. <laughs> partnership with that sounds itself a little bit neoliberal but i think em emphasize where we're starting to emphasize that public part and i and i think this is maybe something i didn't come to before but we've been talking about these demand side machines as energy infrastructure which i think is really really important to emphasize because when you think about all the energy flows and the fact that so much of our energy goes into driving our cars and the batteries of those cars are so big and so much of our energy can be generated on our rooftops with rooftop solar in, in a lot of countries in the world, that you now need to think of these demand side machines and people's households as parts of the critical national infrastructure. So we've celebrated this giant hydroelectricity project in Australia called Snowy Hydro, hugely expensive public project with all the cost blowouts that I believe New Zealanders are all too familiar with around hydro. But that battery will be about one sixth of the size of the batteries in our 20 million electric trucks. Yeah. So the Inflation Reduction Act really has sort of flipped on its head the politics and the economics. Do you think uh, now there is a, a chance that we could, uh, with the introduction of a lot of these machines into the network, if you like, it becomes the infrastructure, not just a thing at the end? that we could, you know, change the way the electricity system works and how we think about it? Um, well, I think the answer to that is you you must. Mm. Um, simply, the if you electrify the vehicles in a house, if you electrify the heating systems in the house, you're likely going to nearly triple the total electricity demand of that household. And... Uh, that's, so that's a fact that we know. We also know from the exist the proof in Australia is that the rooftop solar financed on the roof of your house can deliver electricity at three or four cents per kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. 
That's because it doesn't incur the cost of the local distribution grid. It doesn't incur the cost of the generator or the cost of the big transmission lines that have to go across the mountains. So if you were thinking about a lowest cost future energy system, you'd like to maximize the amount of energy you produce locally under the local distribution grid. And you'd like to maximize the amount that you share around your neighborhood so that you're balancing the electrical loads in the local distribution grid. Um, you will still need some industrial quantities of hydro and, and wind and solar that's generated elsewhere, but um, economically you can see that that's the sort of system that's going to um, be the most critical. The behaviors that are going to be most important are when we charge our cars. Um, Charging cars in Australia when the sun is up is going to lead to extraordinary savings. So this, you know, to, to make very concrete what is to win. If you were charging an electric Toyota Hilux, we can only hope that one of those will exist um, in the future. Uh, on Australian rooftop sunshine, you'd be paying two cents a kilometre. And a, a existing... Hilux in New Zealand on diesel in New Zealand, I'm pretty sure would probably cost you 30 cents a kilometre to run. So that's a massive improvement. And you, because we've got this campaign in New Zealand by farmers and tradies, you know, don't you dare try to electrify my world. Don't you dare take this double cab ute, ute out of my car. I love how they hand. say this while they're holding an unbelievably power electric Makita drill that's, yeah. that's preventing them from getting arthritis. Yeah, yeah. No, you, you, it, it is just a, um, a a short way away from flipping that on its head. How are you doing it in Australia? Uh, because you know you've you've worked on the Inflation Reduction Act. Now you're on electrifying Australia, if you like. What sort of things are you doing, and how's it going? I think the easiest thing to say is um, we're going to solve climate change in Australia with electric jet skis, and. You, you, uh, uh, your audience can't see your face after I said that. Like, <laughs> I can tell them that <laughs> Bernard looks confused. That really is just changing the narrative argument. And I, and I say it cheekily around jet skis because you won't find an environmentalist in the world that thinks a jet ski is a good thing. But a jet ski needs about a 100 kilowatt hour battery pack and an electric jet ski with a 100 kilowatt hour battery pack would be just as fast or faster than your average jet ski. But then you've got this 100 kilowatt battery hour battery pack that sits around for 360 days a year not doing anything. And exactly. You could need yeah. a backup energy system for your house. You know, if you end up having an electric Toyota Hilux and you have another electric car for your other car, the batteries in those are huge and will back up your house. They'll make the total electrical system cheaper. Uh, they'll lower the cost of living for you. They'll lower the, you know, and they'll improve your health outcomes. We know that the leading cause of respiratory illness in households that burn natural gas is the natural gas burning in those households. So you'll get, you'll get healthier, your, your costs will come down. So we are very consciously in Australia selling that story uh, and doing the analysis. So you have to be rigorous. So making dotting the I's and crossing the T's. It's a lot of effort countering the very, very powerful, very well-funded gas industry voices in this matter. And I'm sure that's also true mm. in New Zealand. A little bit it is countering some of the over hyperfication of hydrogen, mm. uh, which is a bit of a distraction. Now, there will be some hydrogen. Hydrogen also, it turns out, starts with green electricity. So it's actually an electric part of an electrification strategy. But there's risk in Australia because of the gas industry that we're going to overinvest in, in the idea of hydrogen, which would be expensive. So we're fighting that fight. So just on that example of the jet ski, because you're right, I was uh, uh, mystified and... Um sort of curious and the idea of you know having your jet ski parked in the garage along with a couple of other um, vehicles with big batteries essentially sucking up the um, the juice from the sun every day when they're just sitting there doing nothing seems really attractive you turn your garage from being a place to store vehicles not being used into essentially a, a place for your energy storage um, it becomes the the sort of um, I've got I've got a six battery garage <laughs> this may be a slightly self-serving argument but you know as much as I'm a virtue signaling greenie I do like vintage cars and I own a 59 Volkswagen dune buggy and a mm -hmm. 1961 Lincoln Continental and a 1963 Land Rover and a 1957 Fiat Multipler 
and I want all four of them to be electrified. And in fact, I've sold it to my wife as a oh. robustness and resilience strategy for our household. <laughs> um, and they're all the batteries I ever need. And honestly, you know, with an oversized solar system on the house, that will year-round work for us in Australia or California, whether we're living in one place or the other, which we're still figuring out. Now, the solar won't work all year round in New Zealand because you're a little bit further south, but it will work for an awful lot of the year. And then you've got the hydro for the other bit of the year. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, you're, you're, the similar story can occur uh, in New Zealand. But I think really it's about selling this as we've got something to win. I think it's about selling a new environmentalist movement about saying yes to things, not about shutting things down and saying no. And then I think really the biggest issue and whether we win this or lose this politically comes down to uh, what they sometimes call climate justice or the equity issue. But my particular slant on the equity issue is the following. The households that need these savings the most are the ones that are struggling the hardest. So saving $3,000 a year on your car would really matter to a household that's got that's earning $48,000 a year not matter so much to a $200,000 a year household. How do you get that household that probably struggles to have the credit access, um, how do you get the electric car into their garage for them? And if you don't do it as a government, don't figure out the mechanisms by which you help everyone come along, you're going to create pretty toxic social divisions as the 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 rich people who wear Lycra on weekends have all of these fancy electric things and everyone else is left out. So I think the political pressure we need is really to help people understand that we need to bring everyone along and everyone's life will improve and we need government policies that are progressive in the sense that they help heal many of the divisions in our society. So, Saul, um, you're now, you know, four or five years into this process of um, focusing on making um, a difference. And clearly you've made a difference with the work you've done with lots of others on the Inflation Reduction Act. Now you're doing it in Australia. How, um, how do you feel about whether we can do this in time? Because even since 2019, um, the climate seems to be generating more um, painful events. And, you know, we're still a long way from a achieving um, some sort of uh, sensible outcome. I mean, how, how confident are you? Do you, when, when, do you wake up in the middle of the night with a cold sweat? The environmental news is terrible. And even just today, the scientists have confirmed that um, Arctic summer sea ice is done. We've already gone past that temperature threshold. That's the first major international climactic system. When they say climactic system, they mean one of the systems that underpins the way the whole earth works. We shut that down. That's bad news. There's a lot of that bad news. No government has made policy, even with all of the extraordinary work of the Inflation Reduction Act, it might get 25% emissions by 2030. So that's half of what you need, not even half what you need, really a third of what you need because we've missed so many deadlines in the last five years. So we're, we're a long way behind schedule. The climate outcomes look worse than we predicted. Um, so that doesn't give you a huge amount of reason for optimism. But things don't work linearly. And just as in climate systems, there are tipping points. There are tipping points that I think we're approaching on the economics, on the social license, on the politics of electrification and fixing climate change. Once we go through those tipping points, I think things can move much faster than people anticipate. And, you know, my third favorite graph of the last few years that I made looked at the rate of increase in the production capacity of all of the renewables, wind, solar, batteries. And if we merely continue to increase the rate at which we increase the production capacity of each of those things, it looks like by 2037, we could be producing all of the world's energy needs from wind, solar, hydro and renewables. Now, as you know, with exponentials in that last year from 2035 to 2037, you know, we install half of it. <laughs> um, but it is still encouraging that we are um, 
not as far away as people might think from the production capacity and the deployment capacity to actually get the job done. So it's a race between the tipping points environmentally and the tipping points in our political economy. Yeah, one and a half degrees won't happen. I think my most optimistic outcome is we might hit 1.8 and then we'll spend a couple of centuries trying to claw it back. But we could go faster. 1.5 is still technically possible, but you would actually need to do what Roosevelt did. You need to declare war on this existential threat and throw the entire economy at it as opposed to ham-fistedly sort of supporting it while also supporting the fossil fuel industry, which is really still, you know, Biden is still approving fossil fuel projects, mm-hmm. as is the Australian government, as is the New Zealand government. Mm-hmm. So um, we are still fighting the war with one arm where our other arm has a knife that's stabbing us in the torso. I'm not sure what the metaphor is. <laughs> Yeah, it's something for me to dream about in the middle of the night um, instead of climate events. Um, uh, Saul, it's wonderful to talk to you. I could go on for hours, but I, I so appreciate your, your time and your stories and uh, uh, to be continued, I'm sure. Um, Saul Griffiths there talking to us from Australia about electrifying our economies. Saul Griffiths, thank you very much for being on When the Facts Change. Thanks, Bernard. When the Facts Change was brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network, together with KiwiBank. Visit kiwibank.co.nz to find out how KiwiBank are making Kiwi better off. Mm-hmm.